Okay, and so the next talk is why would you consider student-driven learning uh, by Peter Smiths? So go ahead, thank you very much. So there we go, cool. Yeah, um, my name is Peter, I'm from Dream. Uh, I'll spare you the elaborate introductions, just that apparently in the Netherlands we love silent eyes. So we just say Dream and just Peter um, with an extra eye. Um, I'm passionate uh, enthusiast for stimulating intrinsic learning motivation in students. And today I'd like to talk to you about that topic briefly. So let's start with the question, why are we teaching? So why are we educating our students? Um, one of the biggest reasons, of course, is to help prepare our students for their future career. Uh, so to improve their employability, their career readiness. Um, another motivation of a teacher instructor might be to see the lights in the eyes light up uh, when they explain something and students get it. Um, however, we know that teaching and preparing their, our students is getting more and more complex in a situation in which we currently are. Uh, also seeing the previous talk and, and other changes uh, in society, not only caused by technology innovations, but also through climate changes. Um, globalization, which leads to a lot of unpredictability in the sense of what we are preparing the students for and what and how to design our education. So we don't really know what the future occupations of our students will look like. We do know, however, that change as a constant requires a lot of flexibility, not, alone, not only on our end as teachers, as instructors, as educators, but also at the end, especially at the end of our students that are learners. Um, and also it requires a lot of responsibility at our learners and to be responsible for their own learning process. Uh, therefore, we are putting an increasing amount of importance to lifelong learning a lifelong development. Then asking why our students are learning. Ideally, the answer would be also to help prepare for a future career, um, to help achieve goals. But if you ask for the honest answer, a lot of students will admit that they learn because they are expected to. Um, we see that during their educational journey, students learn more and more, uh, especially after primary, secondary education, going into uh, further and higher education. Um, there's a lot of focus being put on extrinsic motivation of the students, and um, we see a decline of intrinsic motivation along their learning journey. And a quote that is exemplary of this is something like, I'm not going to this class as it's not mandatory, because I'm sure it will be boring. Um, which implies that the students experience their education as something that they consume as a consumer, rather than something they direct as owners. Um, and also many of our current practices really inhibit this intrinsic motivation. So we do things like grading, assessments, um, big data that is available since the a rise of technology and, and technology-aided learning, digital supervision, of course, and uh, infamously proctoring during the pandemic. Um, on the other hand, we're trying to counter that with practices like more personalized education, uh, more flexible education, more self-directed learning. Uh, and then the question is, how can we do better in that? Um, I'd like to do a quick check-in with you guys. No, I'm not going to do that. I'll save the time for the next quick check-in. Um, so I have another one planned. First, before we dive into the how, no, not before we dive into the how, I'd like to include some theory on designing for intrinsic motivation to really help stimulate the intrinsic motivation of learners when you design your education, when you um, design learning experiences, uh, especially when you design learning experiences that are partly digital. So there's this taxonomy uh, from an old study already. I think the study has been carried out 
before I was born, so more than 35 years ago, but still very valid uh, and still very valid, also validated lots of times afterwards. Um, and in order to help design uh, for intrinsic motivation, there are a couple of um, strategies that you can use and, and in your design of your uh, education. First one is challenge, offering challenge to, to the students, which is quite of an obvious one. So really offer them a way to um, yeah, be, be challenged. So not too easy, not too difficult. Ideally, the perfect flow for them. Um, and it's also translated into they should have a 50% chance of succeeding, meaning it's uh, not too easy, not too hard. Um, the perfect place between anxiety and boredom. Uh, work with a lot of proximal goals. So if you set goals for the students or if you help students set their own goals, thank you. Um, make sure these goals are achievable and not too far away. So not a goal that's only there uh, at the end of the third year when you're starting in your first year. Um, and also, if you're giving feedback to the students on their performance, make sure it's very ipsative. Ipsative is a very nice word. Um, we don't have in the Netherlands, unfortunately. But it means self-referential. So if you give feedback, don't compare the student's performance to a norm, nor to the group of other students, but give feedback based on their previous achievements, their previous performance. That's really important. Um, also, um, if you think of um, awarding or nominating best performing students, uh, you could do it like, um, you could choose to do it like a top three performing students of your class, which is very demotivating for the majority of the rest of the class. You can also choose to personalize that. Similar to when you're running a race, you know who's in front of you, you know who's behind you, but you don't know and you don't want to know who's all the way at the front because that's unreachable. But you might want to know who's right in front of you because you can maybe learn from them in the learning context, but also overtake them uh, or improve your own performance. Um, so to elaborate on that, there's this two by two achievement goal framework that explains how we are motivated uh, in the sense of challenge. So we are either approaching uh, happy things or avoiding negative things. And it's either compared to your own performance, to yourself, or, uh, sorry, it's either appealing to your ego, so comparing to the performance of others, or compared to the task you're doing, compared to um, um, uh, yeah, self-referential competence. And the left top quadrant is the best place to focus your achievement feedback on. The next one is curiosity, stimulating curiosity by uh, surprise, discovery, um, and the way you can do that is providing a sense of inconsistency in content. Um, when we see some inconsistency, that's the thing we're focusing on. So if you imagine having a roof filled with these tiles, might be 200 tiles in a roof, there only needs to be one missing, and that's the thing you're noticing. You're not noticing the rest. There's an inconsistency there. That's what your focus is on. So that's a really powerful motivator to help um, resolve that inconsistency. That's also something you can do in your learning content that you bring to the students. Um, yeah, I think my example was more related to incompleteness, um, but you get the sense so to, to really stimulate their curiosity about what you have and what you present them with. The next thing is also quite obvious, provide them with a sense of control and this control must be powerful and meaningful. So if you're talking about an online environment, if you let them choose the background color, that's control, but it is not meaningful. If you let them choose what, they, what goals they set of, or what steps they want to take to achieve that goal, that's meaningful. That's um, powerful um, and that really helps intrinsic motivation. And the last one is, fantasy, and then I'm not talking about uh, unicorns, as opposed to the image might suggest. I'm talking about appealing to uh, what the student um, 
their their mental space and mental uh, a picture of their world. So that you can do using real world examples, things they can identify identify with, they can imagine, they can relate to, um, and also uh, appeal to personal interests of the students. So these four um, strategies help to build intrinsic motivation uh, and also uh, can be elaborated on and, and um, thanks. Um, can have a perfect place when you design student-driven learning. So in student-driven learning, it's the ideal way to offer not only personalized, flexible and self-directed learning, but also account for all these four strategies, offer challenge, spark curiosity, provide control and trigger fantasy. Um, but then there are, of course, a few challenges to self-directed learning and offering a lot of control and freedom uh, to our students. So now I'd like to you to answer this check-in question. No. Which is the next one? No. Well, I was asked to use Vivox, but then I want to go to the next one. I don't seem. Yeah, it's the same. It's not this one. It should be another one. Well, uh, seeing the time, I'd like to just continue. So I hope your answer would have been to this question something related to the same word I already used unpredictability. So one of the challenges or all the challenges that you will face with giving students a lot of control, a lot of self-recognition is another factor of unpredictability of how your students will learn, what they will do and what their outcomes will look like. Um, and for that purpose, you can employ a student's own portfolio. So an e-portfolio, which you can scaffold and help set boundaries in which students can take control what control they don't have, especially when it's integrated with your VLE. And really use such a portfolio, digital portfolio for assessment as well as development, uh, allowing for authentic assessments, uh, flexible challenge, personal control, and reflective learning as well. Um, so really a tool that offers ample facilities uh, for adequate scaffolding. One of these tools is Portflow. Um, and Portflow um, offers a student-owned portfolio integrated with the, with the VLE built on these principles I just explained. So uh, it's a rich toolkit to appeal to this intrinsic motivation. Um, it teaches students to take ownership of their education rather than being consumers of their education. And um, it also harnesses their flexibility to deal with unpredictability of their future. Um, it addresses diversity by promoting individual strengths, competencies, then rather than focusing on their weaknesses um, and their um, skill gaps. Um, and also allows you to paint a holistic view, get a holistic view of the students' performance, the students' strengths, uh, including their extracurricular, extracurricular activities and learning experiences. In the Netherlands, we have quite a few institutions, universities of all levels using Portflow already and also employing Portflow specifically for this reason, to deal with unpredictability, to empower students to uh, take ownership of their own education, scaffolded in combination with the VLE. We can tell you all about it on an other moment. Um, afterwards, upstairs or tomorrow again. Um, and yeah, that was my presentation. I've talked before, so I'll wait until you kind of answer, ask some questions. No, no questions? Okay. Um, can you tell us just, sorry, can you tell us a bit, how would this 
tool work in practical terms? So any case studies that you can kind of draw on? Yeah, so um, um, we do have a case, case study upstairs. I also brought some with me. Um, and so we see that um, more and more institutions are focusing on skills to help prepare students for their future career and skills that are not bound to single courses. So skills that are learned and acquired throughout the entire curriculum uh, or also even in older chosen activities. And then this portfolio is used to allow students to collect evidence of their learning experiences into one single place, share that with peers, people within their institution and also outside of the institution, friends, family, external experts to give them feedback on their progress towards their goals, competencies, skills. And then, uh, for example, in this case, um, this program has transformed their curriculum towards more of a um, holistic set of goals that students need to be working on. And then they get feedback uh, a couple of times uh, during the semester from various people. And then at a later stage, they um, uh, do a high stakes assessment based on all the previously received feedback to students. Okay. Any other question? Oh, there's one question over there. Yeah, I'll come over. Gonna make me get my steps in. Thank you. Um, I can see you, you're basing this around um, students being intrinsically motivated, but is this therefore quite good for students who are intrinsically motivated? But what about students who have never really experienced so much agency before and so much <laughs> ownership? Yeah. Like how do we get them to get involved without continually prodding them? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. So I think that's where the scaffolding comes in. So a lot of our students have been spoiled maybe by their previous education, getting used to being told what they need to do to get their marks, get their grades, pass the exam, um, and not being used to taking ownership of their own learning. So the scaffolding we have included in this tool, but also is included in, in many digital tools is based on the idea that you can, um, uh, I would say that, um, provide guidelines, guide rails to, for example, help students set their goals. You can offer templates that they help them set their structure of their portfolio, um, help them set the proximal goals. Um, uh, and then you can really differentiate that based on the student's needs. So you can, if you notice a student is more ready to take ownership, you can, for example, leave setting goals up to them fully or uh, give less of a template, less of, less of scaffolding. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you very much to both of you. Very interesting 